Well, many of you are in small group Bible study looking at the book of Hebrews. I know the uh, first chapter of that study was kind of challenging. It, it, it got better though, didn't it? <laughs> um, a little more thinking involved. And now you know the difference between food you have to chew versus a Gerber straight out of the jar and just swallow without choking. Our uh, scripture this morning starts off really describing the whole book of Hebrews. Uh, and so uh, if you've got your Bible with you, great, open it up to Hebrews. It's on whatever page it's on. And if you don't, there's a, a Bible in the pew. Uh, long ago, we're in chapter one, reading the first Four verses. Long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nation. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Let's pray. Lord, without your Holy Spirit here to illuminate our minds and hearts. Lord, these are only words. We pray, Father, you would make these your living word and apply them to our life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, the book of Hebrews opens with the name of its author. You always wondered, I suppose, if you've looked at this book before, who wrote it? It wasn't Apollos, not Luke, not Paul, but this book is written by God. It says for long ago at many times, in many ways, God spoke to us. God did speak indeed many ways in times past. The psalmist writes that the heavens declare the glory of God in Psalms 19. Paul makes it clear that not only creation around, but also conscious within every person verifies the existence of God. If you read Romans chapter one, Paul really outlines that whole downward spiral because our conscious can be very deceiving. Throughout scripture, its angels have attested to the reality of God. Prophets as well. Prophets are men who God has, has chosen to speak forth his word as well as foretell his word. Unmistakably, many of them spoke uh, of God's real involvement in our lives. Yet none of these ways, none of them, creation above, conscience within, creation around us, and the prophets, the angels as well, attested the reality of God. But none of them have given a complete message. It was not fully comprehensible. It was difficult to grasp. So God sent his son, his final, his final word to humanity. There's nothing more to be said, nothing more to be added. Jesus gave us a complete message. There's nothing left unsaid. Jesus has said it all. Does God really speak? Question, I hope most all of us have pondered it sometimes as we wrestle with our relationship with God. Does he really speak to me, to you? Does he speak in my situation? Maybe in even my depression? Maybe my consternation? Most people today says, say that 
God doesn't speak. But our text shouts, yes, he does. How? Well, I've listed four ways God speak to us that, give, that are given in this passage right here. The first one is creation around us. Little history lesson. History was my major when I went to Whitworth before God changed my mind. <laughs> Johannes Kepler. Uh, if you've looked recently at the moon as it gets brighter and fuller, the stars have just been illuminated uh, on a clear night. Johannes Kepler, he's the father of modern astronomy. Astronomy is the study of stars. Uh, the man who coined the phrase satellite. You'd think that's a 20th century word, but no. He coined that phrase in the 17th century. He wrote the foundational planetary laws of motion. Physics still holds those laws to be true describes the orbits of the planet, that they're oval. Before that, they thought they were circular. In fact, they thought we circled them rather than the planets being circular. The planetary laws of motion, the square of a planet orbital period is proportional to the cube of the length of the semi-major axis of its orbit. That, that's probably what you were about to say anyway. <laughs> He's also the astronomer who discovered the elliptical orbit, you know, the egg-shaped orbit of the planets, including the Earth around the sun, revolutionary. But more than that, he's the one that discovered as the planet goes around the sun, it speeds up as it goes by the sun, then slows down on the turn and speeds up. You'd think he raced at Daytona or something. But he discovered that, still new. He wrote, truly when you study the heavens, the cosmos, the galaxies, you have no choice but to be impressed with the necessity, the reality of the creator who designed and ordered the universe. He said, any astronomer who is undevout, and by the word, that word used in that age meant who wasn't a believing Christian. Any astronomer who is undevout is mad. Well, recently, in the modern age, we have a lot of mad scientists. The ball we're sitting on right now is spinning at a rate of 100,000 miles per hour. As it's spinning, this is according to YouTube, it's moving around the sun 67,000 miles per hour, while the sun itself is moving 64,000 miles per hour. And the whole galaxy in which the sun and planet are moving is speeding through space 450,000 miles per hour. Multiply that. And you come to 1,350,000 miles. Are you guys writing this down? No wonder your hair won't stay in place. While all this is happening, there are multiplied billions of other stars, multiplied millions of galaxies also moving in all directions. Who keeps the whole thing from colliding? Kepler was right. There is to be an orderer, an orderer who designed and created this very complex universe. You know, complex things cannot and do not just happen. The very word complex means it's complicated. The universe is complicated and set in order. God does indeed speak through creation, just as Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. I asked this morning in class, did you see that gorgeous, that magnificent sunrise this morning? 
It was a knockout. It was, you know, when you take pictures of that, you're robbed. It's never like, like a rainbow. It's like, huh? It was beautiful. Yet the message sometimes seems contradictory through creation, for although the stars overhead are magnificent, down here where we stand, the earth sometimes can quake, hurricanes can rage, volunteers erupt. Did you see on TV that recent volcano that erupted? A lot of hot pictures there. Yeah, nature is beautiful and serene, but it can also be brutal and severe. Why? Because when Adam and Eve fell through sin and the human race fell as a result of that, creation as well was affected. Consequently, while it's true that God speaks through creation around us, the message is seemingly inconsistent. Talk about prophets among us. Again, in our opening passage that describes the book of Hebrews. The prophet's message, even the prophets themselves sometimes didn't fully understand the message they were giving. What we're experiencing, what we're experiencing today, our salvation through Christ is something by which the prophets, they were intrigued by, they were interested in, but they couldn't get a handle on it. They didn't understand it. You see, the prophets wrote about things they just couldn't figure out. For they, they saw the glory of God. They saw the glory of the Messiah. Psalms 2 talks about that. However, they also saw the suffering servant in Isaiah 53. They saw the triumph of the Mount of Olives, where the returning Messiah, the King of Kings, will stand. But they also saw the blood of Mount Calvary, on which the Messiah died. How can it be? They must have wondered that he will be despised as Isaiah 53 describes. He'll be rejected. He'll be smitten, suffering. And also ruling and reigning as Lord of Lords, King. This doesn't make sense, they said. They saw Mount Calvary. They saw the Mount of Olives. But what they didn't see was the valley between the two. Paul referred to, this is what those prophets would have been filled with joy to see and understand. A valley of about 2,000 plus years of the gospel message, putting it all together. <coughs> they didn't understand that they were writing about <coughs> two advents of Christ, two comings. The first coming when Jesus came, the word of God in the flesh that Messiah would come as suffering servant <clears throat> before he would return as conquering king. Well, what about conscious within us? <clears throat> By the way, that whole moral issue is a real stumbling block for evolutionists. How and why? And where does right and wrong come from? Why do you know that that was wrong to do? The conscience in a person. Third way God speaks is through that conscience. He created us in his image. So we have that image and know what is good, what is beautiful, what is right. And we know also what is wrong. <clears throat> Every person that tells us innately, intuitively, that there must be a God. <clears throat> it's described as that God-shaped vacuum within every person. <clears throat> but people can suppress that knowledge. <clears throat> Why? Because some people think that if they don't acknowledge God, they won't have to be accountable before him. <clears throat> One day they are in for a rude awakening, and even to those who do listen to their conscience, what they hear can be confusing, as Satan accuses us continually. <clears throat> Our conscience isn't always trustworthy. It can be seared. We can flipped over 
and start declaring what was wrong as being right can play tricks on us. We can repress it. It can be seared by our own stubbornness. Consequently, we have a problem. God speaks through creation around us, but the message is seemingly inconsistent. He speaks through the prophets as we go through history and glean what they've said. But what we hear is at times incomprehensible. He speaks through our conscience within us, but the signal is somewhat inconclusive. So what did God do? He solved the problem through the incarnation. The message became the messenger, and the messenger was the message. Oh, thanks. Cheers. All right, good. Now I can go on for another 45 minutes. <clears throat> Jesus is the message. God became one of us. Have you ever heard this song? The ants are coming one by one. Hurrah, hurrah. The ants are coming one by one. Hurrah, hurrah. I see them coming marching rather orderly up the stairs. The ants are definitely headed this way. Slow down, I say. Danger, danger. Nick, our custodian, does an excellent job cleaning. He's going to bring the vacuum out and you're going to be sucked up and cast into outer darkness. You'll go into that black bag where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Turn away, flee while you can. Not a single ant heard my warning. Why? Because I'm so big, they don't even acknowledge my presence. I haven't quite been able to learn ant yet. So I start flicking the lights off and on. Morse code, danger, danger, dot, dot, dash, dot, dot, dash, SOS. You have to speak to your brothers. You have to tell them that a vacuum is on the way and the destruction is imminent. But even these prophet ants that I picked up and told them, go tell, they didn't understand the message. My next plan is to hope that maybe some of them will come to their senses and their conscience will stir them to see that they belong not in the sanctuary but outside. Some do, they say. You know, guys, we really shouldn't be in here, they told everybody. Oh, come on, others said. That's old-fashioned. So I see I have only one option left to bring about their salvation. I need to become one of them so I could speak ant. And as ant, I need to go in their midst and say, listen, guys, I know where I'm coming from. I know what happens in the sanctuary on Sunday afternoons and Monday for sure. You're going to get sucked up. But if you follow me, I'll lead you back down the stairs out. That one I'm not going to lead anymore. And there you'll find the salvation that was intended for you. Follow me. I know where the back door is. That's the incarnation. God became a person, a human being. The word, the word is Jesus himself became flesh. And that's the final way, the perfect way that God spoke to us. The fourth way in this passage, the full way God speaks to us is in his son. God has spoken fully. There's nothing more to say. My wife, Kathy, and I, we lived in Pasadena for three years, and we would often visit the Norton Simon Theater. Uh, it was an art museum. It had some of the great art. It had uh, Rembrandts, and it had great art in the basement, too. It had about 20 Picassos. By the way, I don't think Picasso was a great art artist. So I thought, even though 
it, he was a painter that had masterpieces being on display in the basement, I could make them look much better just with some red, some blue, a little green to add to them. Have you seen Picasso's? Go to the nursery and look on the wall. There may be several Picassos right up there that might be a lot better. They're just these scratchy, weird stuff that someone said, ooh, those are really good. But if I wanted to make them better and add some color, I can guarantee you I would have been arrested. And what I would have been told after I explained I was only trying to make them better, they would explain to me, those are masterpieces, they are finished, not another thing needs to be added to that. My mother-in-law, she was a great painter. Our house is embellished with good art. You know, I know a lot of you have art from some of your relatives that was, you know, this was great, great Aunt Nelda's picture. But boy, you know, you put it on the wall because it was great, great Aunt Nelda's. Not because it's good. Well, we're fortunate that my mother-in-law was a good painter. And we have some wonderful art in our house because of her. <clears throat> For my birthday many years ago, <clears throat> while she was still alive, <clears throat> she wanted to give me a painting. And she had a, quite a large room, her studio, and said, just go in and pick out anyone you wanted. A and I did. I picked out one I liked. She just had a fit. It wasn't finished. I liked it because it really reminded me of a place where I fished. It wasn't finished at all. And she let me know year after year after. You, you want to bring it back and I'll finish it? No, I, ne I never did because I liked it the way it was. I knew what it meant. She would work on multiple different pictures at the same time because they weren't finished. And when she was finished, it was done. It was done. She never had to add or do another thing to it. It might have taken several years for that one picture to be finished, but when it was, it was done. I didn't fully understand that. I like that one. I still have it in my office at home. And if she were to come back from the dead, the first thing she would say is, let me finish that picture. Well, a masterpiece. Jesus is God's masterpiece. The message is finished. It's all that God wanted to say. It's all that God needed to say and intended to say. And he said it when the word became flesh and dwelt among us. God has spoken. Therefore, the Mormons who say, call our 800 number in Salt Lake City for another gospel, we need to add to it. They're wrong. Jehovah Witnesses who say, we'll send you our magazine that will show you that in 1914, more was added to the gospel message. They're lying. They're wrong. New Agers who say, God speaks through crystals and pyramids. Well, that's just stupid. The message is finished. I have spoken completely. I have spoken fully in the person of my son. All you'll ever need to know, you'll know by looking at him, focusing on him, and listening and learning from him. What does this mean? I am so grateful we have God's word. We have three and then a fourth description of this Jesus, men who walked with him, men inspired by God himself. This is what I want you to tell the people down through the ages. In addition to that, we have his very presence. 
when we have communion today, we're not only reminded of what Jesus did for us and forgave us our sins, we're not reminded of a future hope, we're reminded that Jesus is with us. He's present. His Holy Spirit is here. When Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, they went and they hid themselves. You read in Genesis chapter 3, God saying, Adam, where are you? Eve, where are you? God knew where they were all along. How is this to be read? Was God like an angry policeman searching for Adam in order to bust him because of his sin? Such is what uh, many teachers would like us to think, but seeing through the eyes of the Son, God's message to us, this account must be viewed differently. For in another garden, the Garden of Gethsemane, we see Jesus calling his worst enemy at the time, Judas, who betrayed him. Jesus says, friend. Certainly when God called Adam in the Garden of Eden, it wasn't as an angry cop, but it was like a loving father. You'll never understand the Old Testament, Paul's letter or revelation of John if you don't understand the language in which they were written. And that language is in the Son. This is where the Bible teachers and students really miss the boat if they leave Jesus out of their understanding of both the Old Testament and everything about the New Testament. Jesus in the Old Testament, he interprets the law. Jesus interprets Paul in the New Testament. Jesus interprets the prophets. If you want to have the Bible to have a full message, if you want to share it effectively, you've got to understand that it's written in Jesus. Any interpretation of any passage scripture that contradicts the nature of the Son, as seen in the Gospels, misses the point. In Exodus 19, God spoke. Everything you need to know about financial, vocational, relational situations that's already been addressed in the Bible, various places. The answer to those questions are packed in that one book, made up of 66 smaller cohesive books. Study the life of the Son, concentrate in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, and you'll find God's will for every situation but I just wish God would speak to me, we blubber. I wish I could hear him audibly. Now, I've said before, if you want to, <laughs> read out loud. Exodus 19, back to that chapter. Exactly two months after God brought the Israelites out of bondage, out of Egypt, into the wilderness, they arrived at the base of Mount Sinai. I've been there. Depends whether you want the 50 cent tour or the $500 tour. I've been to both places, so I got it covered. There God did speak audibly, and it thundered. The thunder boomed, the mountain shook, smoke billowed, and the people said, you go talk to him, Moses. Tell us what he's saying and we'll do it. But if we talk to him, we surely shall die. So 2,000 years later, God said, I'll speak to you again, not on Mount Sinai, but on Mount Calvary. And the people won't die. God would die for us. When you come to a crossroads of wondering what God's will is, look at Calvary and be reminded once again that if God loved you enough to die for you, there is no doubt that he'll do what's best for you because of his love. Why aren't I hearing from God, people ask? I'm going to prayer, maybe meetings of prayer. I'm reading lots of good books. I'm even reading the Bible. Well, the answer could be because you're not listening to Jesus through those. Amazed to be standing in the presence of the miracle worker and the lawgiver on Mount of Transfiguration. 
Remember when Jesus called them up there and he showed the glory of God. He was transformed. Peter said, let's build a booth for Elijah and Moses and one for Jesus too. And that was big of him. But God interrupted Peter and said of Jesus, this is my beloved son, listen to him. And when Peter looked around, he saw no man but Jesus only. For as vital as the law and the prophets might be, they're inconsequential in comparison to the word made flesh. Therefore, as you study the Old Testament, the law and the prophets, the gospels, and the epistles, the letters to us. Look for Jesus in those passages. Well, you might wonder, well, why didn't God just send his son in the first place? What's with all this history we got to dig through? Why did he bother with that lengthy process of sending the prophets, of speaking through creation? Why didn't he just send Jesus immediately? Well, I suggest our pride is part of that answer. Now, Father, you didn't have to send your son. We would have said maybe. We could figure it out by looking at the stars or your creation. Or if you would have just blessed a prophet, we would have gotten your message from him. Or surely an angel or two would have been sufficient. But history has taught us something. It wasn't sufficient. It's almost as though the Father has to constantly play out all of our options before we realize our stupidity, before we say we're sinners. We're not capable of figuring things out. Father, we need Jesus. You see, had we not gone through the entire process in human history, and I'm so grateful it's recorded for us so we can remember so we can remember, I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, so we can remember God's love for us. God's love for us. I believe we'd have been arguing perpetually, oh, Father, you didn't have to become human to dwell on us. You could have certainly died for us in another way, but that's the way God chose to do it. You could have just given us 10 rules. Ten rules, that's all. Any one of them, you read them out loud, simple. Don't murder. Wow, I hate that guy. I could kill him. Jesus even made it harder to follow. Ten rules. That's the tendency of humanity, to feel like we can do it. I'm the captain of my ship. I didn't mean to be swimming. I didn't mean for the ship to go down, but we need help. And a lot of times we need to be put in that position before we realize how screwed up we can make our life. So God has to allow history to unfold in such a way that we can see that at times we're losers, failures, blockheads, idiots, until we, did I leave anything out there? until we say, we're stuck. We need your son to dwell among us. We need a savior to die for us. We need Jesus. The gospel revelation of Jesus is the final revelation God has given us in beholding the power, the wisdom, the goodness of the Father. John 14, 7 said, Jesus Told the disciples, if you know me, you know the Father. The fullness of the Godhead dwells, not typically, not figuratively, but reality in Jesus. And Jesus is in the inheritor, again, the way this passage closed. Jesus told a parable in Matthew 13 as the inheritor. The parable was a man found a very, very expensive pearl in a field. And he went and he sold all that he had to purchase that field so that he could have that treasure. What the parable is about 
It's not about selling everything to buy the treasure of the gospel. Nor for, in an uh, earlier parable, in the same chapter, Jesus says, the field is the world. Jesus bought the world with his own blood. Why? Because he wanted that pearl, that pearl. He wanted the treasure, the treasure. We are the treasure. We are his inheritance that the author of the book of Hebrews is talking about. The covenant of grace, the wondrous doctrine, the before the cosmos, before anything was created, our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit decided to redeem a people for the honor and glory of his name. The Father choosing who would be redeemed, the Son agreeing to purchase their redemption by his shed blood, and the Holy Spirit agreeing to apply Christ's redeeming work to the elect. It's amazing, this book. Jesus is calling us to be a part of that redeemed people. <clears throat> Communion reminds us, we've answered that call. Yes, I will follow Jesus. Will you? Let's pray.